I'd like to start by thanking the uh, organizers for the opportunity to, uh, to give this talk. And what I will be doing is to um, discuss some recent developments in um, semi-classical gravity theory. And um, And some um, surprises that we that have sort of come about in the last couple of years, um, where semi-classical gravity seems to be working better than it um, than it has any right to uh, than one would have expected. So it is uh, said that uh, it is surprisingly effective as a as a theory. So we will um, let me just give you a brief outline. Um, so this is all in the context of uh, the of Hawking's uh, black hole information paradox. So I'll start with a very brief introduction of sort of just a motivation of from there, and then I will immediately jump into um, basically making some assumptions where we'll assume that the evolution of a black hole is unitary. That is, if we have a black hole that's formed from a pure state, it'll then remain, the full system will remain a pure state and we'll make some further assumptions, which will then allow us to infer some results for um, about the entanglement entropy or the entanglement properties of the various subsystems. And um, <clears throat> we will be following some old, old work of, of Don Page. And then I will lead, use that to lead into these more recent um, results where people have, which are come from uh, holographic duality. They are um, basically from working out holographic representations of entanglement entropy. People have learned over the years that uh, there are certain terms that need to be included. And it turns out that in the black hole context, those uh, terms become quite important and, and dominant in fact, as the evolution of the black hole uh, goes on. And this allows us to resolve a number of puzzles. Uh, we still are quite, um, it doesn't, certainly does not resolve all puzzles involved in, in black hole evaporation, but uh, it's, a, it's an important step, I believe. And what I will, most of the talk will be, I will explain to you uh, a simplified version, sort of how this all plays out in a simple toy model, which is work uh, that was done in our group here in Reykjavik. And because uh, it, it is sort of allows us to do things very explicitly and, um, and get analytic ex expressions for many things. And at the same time, um, avoid some of the, because this model is in two dimensions, it avoids a number of, of, of issues that are, one expects in higher dimensions. So one gets to this result in a clean way, but obviously this is a toy model. And so there are limitations to how much we can interpret what we get, but uh, we'll get there. And so roughly I will spend some time uh, introducing the models, discuss the black hole solutions, how one introduces semi-classical effects like the Hawking effect. It's a rather beautiful story involving a conformal anomaly. And then we'll get to the more recent uh, story about how, how this, uh, allows us to derive using only semi-classical physics, a, a page curve for the, uh, for the black holes in this model. And then if there's time at the end, which is perhaps not very likely, uh, I would like to add maybe a little bit about another place, another um, uh, aspect of semi-classical physics in these particular models, which uh, actually allowed us also to look at um, concept of holographic complexity in these, model, these are models that um, evaporate, and so they, they are not around forever. And it turns out that uh, one can still do um, analytic computations of the holographic complexity with interesting results. And it's another case where semi-classical physics is actually working a lot better than it uh, than you would have expected. Okay, so we're going to talk about black hole evolution. So. Hawking formulated this uh, uh, Gedanken experiment in um, 1976. So you imagine that you have matter uh, in some initial state, which is a pure quantum state, and it's a, a 
pure quantum state of uh, an effective theory that includes both the matter and some you know, low energy gravitational degrees of freedom. This matter then undergoes gravitational collapse and forms a black hole, at which point um, we know that at the classical level, practically all information about the initial configuration is hidden inside behind the event horizon. And this doesn't lead to any paradox, yet you can simply stipulate that the information about the initial state is sitting inside the black hole, but Hawking had two years earlier uh, demonstrated that the black hole doesn't stay around. <clears throat> it um, will gradually evaporate due to the Hawking effect. And at the end of the day, if we assume that there is no remnant left behind, or at least whatever remnant is left behind just has a finite uh, number of states associated with it, then the final state will be this outgoing radiation. And the semi-classical calculation that Hawking did uh, gave a result that this outgoing radiation was in fact thermal. So it is in a mixed quantum state. So this full effect, this full evolution seems to have involved us from a pure quantum state in our initial, um, in our effective field theory. And uh, we end up in a mixed state, which is then a violation of unitarity. And there are various uh, ways you can now go by. You can try to accept this simply and say that when gravitational effects are taken into account that um, unitarity is not preserved and, and there have been attempts to do this. Now, I will not be um, going down that way, that avenue, uh, although that's, there are some interesting uh, questions to explore there for sure. Another possibility is try to make sense of um, in this really assuming that there is no information that comes out during the evaporation and that it's all left in a, in a Planck scale remnant. But those tend to be very tricky to, uh, to deal with. They have uh, phenomenological problems, if you like. They are Planck scale objects that have an infinite density of states and lead to uh, various divergences and then just very basic uh, scattering processes. Each one of those, you know, when they're pair created, they will each pair will interact very weakly with uh, with any any um, process, but their sheer number will um, still dominate. Okay, so the assumptions that I'm going to work from is that this whole process is in fact unitary, and that there are some subtleties that are going on that are not captured by the semi-classical um, reasoning. And um, of course, the punchline of uh, <clears throat> this, the, the talk and, and this recent, these recent developments is that some of those subtleties are in fact addressed by semi-classical reasoning once the, um, that reasoning has been augmented by, or add, you know, with some input from, um, from holographic theories. And so the basic assumptions that I'm gonna make here, and these are assumptions that uh, basically put forward Sort of the, the early work on in, in, in this was by Don Page, uh, sort of was the champion of this viewpoint very early on. And then this was followed by Toft, who did, uh, attempted to, to evaluate explicitly an S matrix for black hole for this, this format, this process. And then um, the work by our group at Stanford. Uh, on uh, black hole complementarity falls into this category. In fact, these, the formulation of these assumptions is, is more or less from that paper. And there was simultaneous work by, by um, Caroline Schaltens and, and the Belinde brothers. And, and then the list goes on and on and on. Of course, this has been a, a central problem for a long time with us. And so the assumption that we're gonna make is that the black hole um, at any given time is a more or less conventional quantum system. That has some discrete energy levels and it has in particular a finite density of states. And in fact, that, that density of state is um, given by the um, exponential of the, um, of the Bekenstein Hawking entropy. So that the black hole entropy is in fact um, a measure of the, um, <coughs> of the dimension of the subspace of states that uh, one should associate it to the black hole. And then we will assume that, as I said earlier, that if we have, well, this is the number three there is just the assumption of unitarity that I mentioned before. And then comes a further uh, assumption here that we're going to make it, which is that after the black hole has formed, that we can meaningfully divide the 
full system into a subsystem that is consists of the outgoing Hawking radiation, well separated from the black hole. Now, how well separated, we'll, we'll talk about a little bit later on. Um, presumably, it's actually enough that it be that we view everything that's outside what's called the zone of the, the black hole, which is roughly a couple of uh, Schwarzschild radii out if we're talking about Schwarzschild black holes. Um, and then everything else. That is not the Hawking radiation, that's basically the black hole and, and, uh, and perhaps some Hawking radiation that's on its way out is very close to the uh, sort of in the process of being emitted and maybe even will be reabsorbed if there are great body factors in the problem. Okay, so these, we're going to assume this and uh, we're going to then use. Um, okay. A result from uh, that formula that Don Page uh, proposed in, in 1993 and which was then later proved by, uh, by Sen. And so what Page did was, was rather general. He simply imagined that he had a quantum system uh, which was a composite system of systems that had uh, of, of Hilbert space of dimension M and N respectively. And he thought, Thought of those as subsystems of the full state, and, and then imagine that the full system was in some pure state, and that was randomly selected. Basically, just um, the only condition on it, on the state vector, was that it was normalized. And then he formed the, in the usual way, he formed the reduced, the first a density matrix you can form for this pure, from this pure state, and then you take the reduced density matrix for one of the subsystems by tracing over the degrees of freedom of the, the other, over the states of the other, sorry. And then after some manipulations and using the fact that you are, you picked a random pure state and you also assuming that the uh, distribution this leads to of, of, of the, uh, of course for different states, you're gonna get different values of this in the entropy, but that distribution should be quite sharply peaked and um, you can get the average values by simply doing an average over all the state vectors. Now, and if you do this, you'll get an answer that, that's given here. Um, and in particular, if one of the subsystems is bigger than the other, and both of them have a fairly large dimension, then you can simplify the, these formulas and you find that it goes, you get this leading term here in this. And this is in fact, just the maximal entropy that a system dimension M, the Hilbert space of dimension M can have. So this is basically the coarse grained or thermal entropy of that system. And what this is telling us is that as long as a one of these systems, basically this is going to be given. So M is the smaller dimension. And so this entanglement entropy is going to track very closely the maximal, the thermal entropy. And this is a plot from uh, Page's original paper. Um, shows this rather well. This, does this, this is done so numerics on some really finite dimensional system. And you find that there's actually a, a, this correction term here that um, in this early on here is going to be actually is, is, is less than one, less than a half actually here. So we're tracking this very closely until we get to the halfway point here where these two entropies are have to be equal. And of course, yes, the entanglement entropy of, of one subsystem is going to equal the other because we're assuming that we're in a pure state. And then it must bend over and come back down again in a symmetric fashion. Here, here we're just counting the, the axis here is the entropy. And um, so this is how things have to go. Whereas in Hawking's original calculation of the black hole, uh, the entropy of, of Hawking radiation, it actually corresponding curve would just keep going up here. So that is the thing which one wants to uh, explain, which how does this actually happen? And the assumption that uh, and the understanding that people have had over, over the years is that this is presumably due to some very subtle uh, correlations between early and late um, Hawking photons. So this is not 
um, presumably fairly non-local physics. And so therefore it's quite surprising that with just a simple modification that it comes out of, out of um, holography, one actually sees the semi-classical um, expressions do this, do this. So let's um, see how that works. And by the way, if, if you have questions, please, uh, you should interrupt as we go along. Now, if we apply this um, to the special case of a black hole and its Hawking radiation, then the entanglement entropy that we want to calculate is for one of these subsystems that I talked about earlier, which is either the outgoing radiation that's well separated from the black hole or whatever is basically um, left behind. And uh, there are different ways to, um, to approach this. And the breakthrough that came in, in 2019 and, and these papers where it was, if you added a, a correction term that was already known from work on holographic entanglement entry, but if you, if you included that correctly in, in this context. Now, in order to use a holographic formula, um, these authors embedded their black hole in an asymptotically anti-decider space-time. So these were so-called large uh, ADS black holes. Now, of course, those have a slight problem, which is that they, for this particular um, problem, which is that they don't really evaporate. They, um, they are stable against evaporation. Uh, basically, the logic goes that whatever uh, evaporation goes from them gets um, sort of reflected back by the uh, curvature of the ADS geometry. And the way they uh, approached this was, um, was to couple the system to an external. So basically the, by holographic duality, the ADS black hole describing a state in some uh, dual conformal theory. And so that conformal theory was then coupled to uh, uh, basically a reservoir that could absorb the uh, outgoing Hawking radiation. Now exactly how this, this uh, comes about is uh, I think a little bit, uh, uh, well, one has to be careful because uh, it, it, it exactly how you do this coupling is, is um, can be, um, I think there are some unresolved issues there which uh, I won't really go into, but if you do this in uh, particular, and this is where most of the technical um, computations in these papers were done, is in the context of, again, two-dimensional gravity. This is the Jackie title poem, gravity, especially in the second paper, um, which is all another theory where you can um, do very explicit computations. And there, these issues are actually less uh, worrisome than I think you can actually, in, a, in quite a precise way, introduce such a coupling to absorb the outgoing Hawking radiation and therefore allow the black hole to evaporate. Um, and they then, having set up that sort of engineered that setup, they evaluate the so-called generalized entropy, which is um, a, the holographic entropy of, of one component. In fact, that because we're assuming we're in a pure state, it doesn't really matter which component you compute it for, uh, which includes the usual um, Ryo Takayanagi holographic entropy term, sort of as a classical contribution, but then there is a leading order um, correction that comes from, um, that had been proposed some years earlier and, and uh, has been tested in various ways and even derived to some extent um, using, using the replica method. And uh, it basically instructs you to also calculate the bulk, um, the entanglement entropy of the bulk matter fields in a certain region that's also uh, determined by the same uh, minimal surface that the Ryo Takenagi. And a crucial thing is that you should 
evaluate this functional and then do your extremization. So you don't extremize for the Ryotaki and Aki surface until you've already added this uh, correction term. And this is where you're gonna get the, the, uh, the difference and where you're gonna get your page curve to work out. And that's because early on in the evolution, in this part here, if we're calculating the entanglement entropy of the Hawking radiation, you're gonna find that it's these bulk fields, it's just the uh, photons or whatever are the particles that are carrying the, they are, um, as they get emitted, uh, they are entangled pairwise with, uh, with some modes that are sitting inside the black hole. This is an old story that uh, at least qualitatively one can use as a, as a visual aid. And then the, you get a monotonically rising um, entanglement entropy, but once you've included these two terms here, you will find that um, there is another uh, extremal surface that you can find at least it's, it forms shortly after you've uh, formed the black hole. And um, early on, you can calculate this generalized entropy. You simply get a larger number and then we're instructed to always, if you have more than one of these extremal these are called quantum extremal surfaces, the ones that extremize this combination. And if you have one which is um, has a larger value than, than another one, then you always go with the one that has. So you're basically instructed to always pick the minimum one. And then when you have this crossover, the instruction tells you that you should now follow here. And we will see how this works in a, in a simple model. And then we'll talk at the end a little bit about how, how this um, one can infer various things about how information is, is um, contained in the bulk fields or not inside the black hole. Okay. So what one finds therefore is that one can in fact with this prescription uh, get a curve like this. And this actually, this plot that I have here is, is not just a sketch. It is the quantitative result of the two dimensional calculation that I'm going to show you. That is, this is what you get to leading order for a large mass black hole that's formed in the so-called RST model and then evaporates. And you find that the page time in this case is exactly uh, one third of the black hole lifetime. In, um, so it's not halfway point, even though these black holes evaporate at a fixed um, temperature. But that's also something one can very easily understand because the emission process is an irreversible process. So the entropy growth here is actually faster than, um, than it would be in a reversible process. And therefore this slope here is actually twice than what this is. And that explains this one third. Now, of course, in a, in a, this is a stochastic process, the evaporation. So this of course is just the average value here uh, fluctuations in the energy of the, of the Hawking photons and in the times that they get emitted, of course, will round this off. And that's something that can also be studied, um, but we will not worry about that here. Okay, so I think I've already said uh, most, of, most of what's on here. So there are these two um, lines of argument. This, at least the first part here is what I've just been going through is that you, you couple the system that's, uh, you have a black hole in ADS, which is then uh, governed by uh, a dual CFT, which then you couple to, so you have these two CFTs. One of them is what we call the external or the reservoir. And the other one is the CFT dual of the, of the, of the black hole system. And this sort of coupling to extract Hawking radius, this was studied already back uh, over 10 years ago by, by uh, Rocha in, in 2008, Rocha. And uh, so the, that's sort of a construction that gets uh, adopted here. We're assuming that the full state, full system is in a pure state. And so we can all sort of calculate one or the other and we'll see that it's will be easier to actually compute um, this one uh, later on. And then we use this quantum corrected holographic entanglement entropy to, to evaluate, to extremize and, and then pick the minimum value here. Um, but what I'm actually gonna show you is a story that's 
it proceeds in a very parallel, very much a parallel fashion, but it's in asymptotically flat space time. So there you might worry, of course, what do you mean by, you know, how are you going to use a holographic formula in asymptotically flat space time? Well, it's not any asymptotically flat space time, it's actually a linear dilaton background. A linear dilaton background, it, it is a background that is closely related to some uh, five brain uh, soliton solutions in, in, in string theory. And in fact, there are holographic duals in that context. Uh, the uh, linear dilaton backgrounds are holographic usually to non-conformal theories, but there is a dictionary. And um, so one, so we're basically proceeding, so we're using that as motivation, but we're really taking this uh, generalized uh, entropy formula sort of as a, we can also take that simply as a prescription and see what it gives us. And what we'll find is that it gives us exactly what we want. And then maybe we should then go back and be, be really motivated to understand how it comes about. But I do believe that it uh, can be motivated um, from these um, linear dilaton, um, sort of holographic dictionary for linear dilaton backgrounds. Now, at the same time, this model that we're working with is not, we're not doing string theory here because we're going to couple it to a large number of matter fields that are just picked sort of for simplicity. And uh, we're also gonna do some manipulations on it to make it soluble in the semi-classical limit. And so this is definitely a toy model, but it, it, it has sort of a pedigree that it comes from, it's closely related to, and, and the dilaton gravity sector of it, the classical level is certainly coming from string models from string theory. Okay. So what we'll then do is simply adapt this uh, generalized entropy prescription to this model, uh, requires a few steps. And then we need to do a computation, of course, we need to compute these different terms in, in generalized entropy. And for that, we also uh, pick up some tricks from, uh, from holography. Um, and, um, and I'll get to that in a minute, okay. Now, this generalized entropy that we're calculating, the prescription is as follows. Now imagine that we have some gravitational uh, geometry here, uh, asymptotically ADS, let's say. And uh, so this is a, a, just a sketch that there's this boundary where so we put in a cutoff place a boundary there and roughly speaking, that's where we define the UV, um, the, the boundary CFT in the UV. And then in order to compute the holographic or the entanglement entropy that you would associate it with a subregion, the fields defined in a subregion. So the boundary here is this horizontal line here. Um, we have a subregion A, we want to calculate the holographic entropy in that region and then the instruction is that we find um, a minimal surface that extends into the bulk and we calculate the area of that surface. That's this first term here. This is the original Ryu Takianagi term. Now, of course, we're going to be interested in an evolving geometry, so it's a little bit more subtle than this. But roughly speaking, what one does is you pick a time slice, so a Cauchy surface, which intersects the boundary, in, whose intersection with the boundary includes this region of interest, you then calculate the minimum area surface on that slice. Then having done that, you will repeat that for all possible slices that actually have satisfied this boundary condition and you maximize over those. So this is the sort of mini minimization, mini, minimize then maximize good prescription. And then for the second term, what you're instructed to do is to actually take the bulk theory and you compute. So that is, uh, well, supergravity with some, uh, some uh, matter fields in, in the original ADS, ADS CFT. And you, um, you're to, to calculate, just do that as an effective field theory and calculate the bulk contribution from the volume that's enclosed by the on the one hand, the surface, this uh, uh, extremization surface and, and the original surface on the boundary. So that's the prescription. And then the key thing is that you don't, you should do this extremization as you evaluate both terms and then extremize. And then you pick the one that gives you the minimum value, minimum extremal value, and then, then you're done. You've got your, uh, 
Um, and a further point that important point here for, for the work uh, for these ADS black holes is that we're actually going to couple, we're going to envisage that the coupling to the external boundary is actually happening at the boundary here. And that therefore the region A that we're interested in is in fact the entire spatial boundary of your ADS space. And so therefore your minimizing surface um, is going to be simply an extremal, is gonna be a co-dimension surface somewhere in, inside the bulk here. That is uh, surfaces that are homologous to the, to the boundary then, to the full boundary, or it can be surfaces in the bound, in the bulk. So that is the extremization problem that we're gonna be looking to, to solve is to look for, sort of do an extremization over or possible co-dimension two surfaces inside the bulk geometry that are, you know, with the prescription that I went through before. Okay. Now, for a black hole in asymptotically flat space time, we're gonna do things somewhat differently. We're gonna use the fact that Hawking radiation can now freely stream away from the black hole once it gets into the linear dilaton region, the asymptotic region. In fact, it doesn't have to go very far from the black hole to be, um, if you take a very large black hole, then your, um, uh, your, your gravitational coupling or the coupling of your effective theory is, is actually can be made as small as you like outside the, um, outside the black hole. And you, so we will simply put in this, this curve will again, the, this surface will again be a co-dimension two surface, which of course is a point now in, in, in two dimensions. So we're gonna do this extremization for, for points uh, inside the two dimensional geometry. And, uh, but of course this theory descends from a higher dimensional theory. So points are in fact, they correspond to two surfaces. This is an S, S wave reduction of a higher dimensional theory. I'll, I'll mention that in a minute, we'll elaborate on that in a minute. And so we're going to have basically, when we look at this then as a function of time, we have a curve in our geometry that separates system at any given, on any given time slice separates it uh, into two systems. One is the black hole, which is inside the curve. And then the outside is, is where the Hawking radiation is, is moving away. So once the Hawking radiation goes past this curve, we call it the anchor curve. Maybe as an abuse of, of language, it surely comes from a previous computation we were doing where we did a very similar construction to do holographic complexity which I probably will not get to at the end. But this, this curve basically is at any given time where it intersects your Cauchy surface, that's this separation point. And you can do this away from the black hole. So it, and you can do, and you can basically by moving this curve further away, you can make the gravitational coupling as small as you like, but it's never gonna go quite to zero. Um, that's actually not so different from if, when you really, when push comes to shove in the ADS computation, you actually also do it. You don't put the uh, boundary curve, don't take the boundary to be asymptotically far away. Um, in fact, to avoid backscattering, not having to worry too much about backscattering, Pennington, for example, he, he placed his, um, Sort of where, where he mines, he mined his Hawking radiation in the ADS space time actually not that far from the black hole. And um, so there are similar issues that need to be uh, dealt with there, but they can be dealt with in, in, a, in a similar way. And also you can make some general arguments if you're not really looking for explicit answers, you can make some general arguments about how the, how the uh, gray body factors are going to affect things or the backscattering. But we're gonna stick with this, this simple model and we're going to um, look at how this, how this works in this case, okay. So maybe uh, it's best to show you a picture. Once we've, uh, once I've uh, constructed for you, which I'm actually not gonna do, I'm just gonna show you the solutions. The point is that this 2D model, despite all its simplicity, it actually has black holes at the semi-classical level, which have exactly the same causal structure as, as uh, what you expect an evaporating 
uh, uncharged black hole in, in four, three plus one dimensions. So this is of course why they are in, particularly interesting as toy models because you can ask sort of very similar questions or principle of them. So the Penrose diagrams that we draw here, they look exactly like what you would draw for a black hole formed in uh, collapse and then evaporating in higher dimensions. But they are actually um, explicit. I mean, we, you know, the uh, you can do the explicit um, conformal map to, to actually construct these diagrams based on the analytic solutions that you have in the model. So that is, of course, what makes it a nice uh, lab to work with. Okay. So we're going to do that. We're going to formulate this problem in a solvable 2D model. Um, we're going to adapt this formula for the generalized entropy. So basically we're going to calculate the generalized entropy for a, so our uh, Ryotake and Nagi surface is going to be basically, at any given time is going to be uh, this point on this curve. Um, at early times when there this island phenomenon that we're getting to, it doesn't occur. What you're calculating is the entanglement entropy, either of the radiation that has gone outside here or equivalently, you can calculate the uh, entanglement entropy, the bulk entanglement entropy of all the fields that are in this. So this here would then be the thing that corresponds to the region AB here, okay? And the surface that is the extremization surface is actually the empty surface just at the uh, at the origin of your right so that's the only extremum you have at very early times and so you want to calculate uh, and of course the area of that surface is trivially zero or or in the semi classical model you know it's order 1 in planck units uh, so the tricky thing is to compute this and uh, for that we're going to actually use holography as well we're going to follow these authors here and we're gonna use basically ADS3 CFT2. So this is a two dimensional uh, gravity theory. It's uh, any two dimensional uh, geometry, it's conformally flat. And you can actually embed this into a ADS geometry. And if you're careful about the uh, coordinate systems that you work with and uh, you, you can actually uh, arrange things so that you are your embedding space is actually just pure ADS3. And the price you pay for that is the boundary, the, the, um, the regulator boundary. So this guy is going to be the, the uh, boundary theory of some ADS3 gravity. Uh, the cutoff is going to be, is going to depend on where you are. And so that's how you are going to get non-trivial um, um, dependence on where you are in the geometry. And then you were going to use just a standard Ryutake and Aki prescription, which says that you should calculate the, for this, um, in the 3D story here, you should calculate basically now it's a three dimensional, so it's the length of the geodesic, ADS geodesic that connects the endpoints here. So a lot of our uh, technical, so the technical aspect of the paper was simply to uh, sort out how you how you do the regulator there and, and how you get this. And once you have that, then you will have computed your um, your uh, bulk term and the entanglement entropy. Similarly, here you have once later on when you have a new extremum where you actually cut off this bulk integral at some interior point. This is going to be the point that where I'm calculating the area term. Now the area here has some finite value, which is easily calculated. It's given just by the dilaton field or it's semi-classical generalization. And then you can do a very straightforward extremization problem, find out where this, where you, where you get this uh, to take. Can I, can I ask one question? Yep. Yeah, so I mean the 3D bulk dual of these uh, evaporating RST black holes has it been done explicitly? No, well, as explicitly as you, as you need, you know, use, using the, the, the steps here, you actually, by, as I said earlier, but if you're clever about the coordinates that you're using, uh, the part of the dual that you need to calculate, you know, to connect these endpoints, 
is just pure ADS3. As long as you stay away, you know, you're not close to the singularity, but there are many other reasons to stay away from that region anyway. Yeah. So it's so the answer to your question is I believe is no, but we don't really need it. We only need the sort yeah. of the asymptotic ADS region of it. But I mean the evolution of the evaporating black holes, a black hole that's not in uh, thermal equilibrium with radiation. Yep. That in terms of a bulk dual, uh, that's I mean, you say that you you don't need that. You're not going to. No, use. if you um, um, I w there's an argument you can make, which is that if you assume that the infalling matter, and this is an old argument that was used, people uh, back in the '90s, uh, Strominger and collaborators calculated this entanglement entropy in fact yes. just by you know summing you know over three fields in the in this model, and um, if you make the assumption that your black hole is formed by a coherent state. So the in infalling matter field is in a coherent state, which is a reasonable thing because that's the closest thing to a classical field that you're going to get. Yeah. In that case, the entanglement entropy is actually the same as on the vacuum state. So that's the key in that there. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas if you do the eternal black hole, it turns out that working in the cross goal coordinates and normal ordering, so basically doing the hartle hocking normal ordering, uh, that gives you immediately the, the, the same result. So who knows, I might get there uh, before the end of the talk, but uh, we're, uh, so, but I, I think it's an interesting question. Can you actually you know, do better than this? But for the purposes of what we wanted to do, this was, this was good enough. And we were basically, and it was the same thing here. They were doing this for Jackie Teitelboim gravity and, they, and it was the same argument. Okay. Can I also ask a question, please? Yep. Uh, thank you. M more naive of a question. Uh, you are in asymptotically, you describe an asymptotically flat black hole. Uh, what, uh, but you're using Ryu Takayanagi and generalized entropy formulas. Uh, this is motivated by the fact that uh, you can embed the matter in ADS3. Uh, no, it's actually more that this uh, descends from a, like a linear dilaton uh, background in. in uh, Actually, in five plus one dimensions, originally okay. through, through a, it's actually kind of a bit of a roundabout way. It, it, it sort of makes a, uh, a st stop in four dimensional dilaton gravity, which is then you take some extremal magnetic uh, cause. In fact, I, I think that might be the next slide. Um, and okay. the motivation for using Ryotaki and Nagi in the original computation, you know, sort of to, uh, to um, is is that you're allowed to do that in, idea, in asymptotically uh, linear dilaton backgrounds. And even if you, if, you, if you don't believe that, you can still, or I can still just take this as a prescription and see if it, where it leads me. Um, so let's say that that's, that's, that's what I'm doing. But I, I do believe it's a little bit better than that. And of course, there are these derivations, rather formal, uh, using replica, um, so with replica uh, wormholes, which are, um, I'm not going to have much to say about, but that, that is a way to actually sort of motivate and derive, if you like, this formula using some formal path integral arguments. But those path integrals are, of course, as always in, in gravity, they're ill-defined. In fact, the subtle points that the replica wormholes correspond to are not conventional subtle points. They're, they're in some sort of complexified uh, formulation. Uh, actually, I, as far as I know, but I, you know, somebody will maybe correct me, but I don't think there are any explicit constructions of, of those saddles. There are some overfold limits of them, but not, I don't think the actual, but anyway, so there, there are various reasons to, to, to uh, you know, look at this formula and, and it's giving us a rather nice, nice answer. Um, can, I, can I ask us a question? Okay. Yep. Uh, it's about the anchor curve. Is that mm -hmm. uniquely defined or are there? Uh, no, you can place it, uh, for convenience, we place it at a fixed value of the dilaton field. That is sort of a coordinate independent um, location. And we put it at about, as is the, the coupling of the theory is governed by the dilaton field. We place it where the coupling is weak. Now, if you make your black hole large, the initial mass of the black hole large compared to the scale of the model, uh, you're going to 
you, you'll find that you're already in a weak coupling region once you're outside the horizon. So you can more or less put it anywhere you like outside the horizon. And for some things, it actually makes sense to keep, keep it not that far from the horizon since you're already in the weak coupling region. But you, the, the results we get were all in formulated in terms of the retarded time so of, of, on that curve. So you sort of factor in the time it takes the Hawking radiation to actually get there from the black hole. Okay, um, let's see. Larus, do you have five minutes left? Yeah, okay. So I think I'll just skip showing you the model. I'll just show you the, uh, the results, but we can very, at least, you know, I should uh, you know, give some credit where credit is due. This is the model that we we'll start from. It's called the CGHS model, Callan, Giddings, Harvey, and Strominger. And it is, a, like I said, it's a 2D dilaton gravity model that you can either view it as sort of a, just an interesting model in itself that has explicit solutions that have these features that I mentioned earlier that they have their Penrose diagrams are identical. Well, actually for that, you need the semi-classical corrections that, I, that I'll get to in a moment. Uh, it has a, an inherent scale that comes from um, its higher dimensional uh, origin, but let's, so we, we just use that as our reference. You then, there's a, a well-oiled machinery for actually solving this. You, you pick conformal gauge, you pick then within that, there is so-called Krusko gauge where you identify the conformal factor with the diloton. And this you can do because of a symmetry that's uh, in the model. And once you do this, uh, you can find a, a general, uh, solutions, you can in fact find the exact analytic solution for arbitrary incoming matter distribution. And then what you do is you assume that you have a large number of these free fields that's in the original model. For us, we will actually just assume that we have some conformal field theory. I would like it to be strongly coupled because we're going to do uh, uh, use ADS3 CFT2. But the point is that the matter only comes into the equations through the stress tensor, so you can actually just use general results for conformal field theory. So this is the model. Uh, yeah, it has some you know, nice solutions. You can explicitly find the, the linear to the tone. Uh, there's some black hole thermodynamics you can do. You find that, and this is maybe the main part, the Hawking temperature of these black holes is actually independent of their mass. So they're unusual from that point of view. Um, and what I mentioned earlier is that the area well, I may not have mentioned it, but it's it's governed actually by the value of the dilaton at the horizon. And in turn, the because of the way the model is defined, you see the, the gravitational sector here has the dilaton sitting out front, which tells you that it's the coupling as well. Okay, so these are the classical solutions. There's a whole you know very nice story about how you get the Hawking effect from the conformal anomaly that I will not go into here. Uh, once you do that, you can understand Hawking radiation in a classical background, you can then, and well, this is what Callan et al. did, you can systematically include the back reaction by putting in the Poyakov term, uh, and it um, leads you to a semi-classical model. Now that semi-classical model is not solvable in, or at least it's not easily solvable unless you add, or at least what we did was we added a, an extra term, which is allowed by the symmetries, and in fact, it's a term that restores the symmetry that allowed you to go to this Kruskal gauge. And this is the key, you know, to a lot of the, uh, you know, why things are so uh, explicitly doable there. You get equations and field equations that are practically the same as the uh, classical case, but the interpretation of the fields is different. And there's a, there's a story here about how singularities occur uh, that I won't go into the, the the message is basically that you can write down again an explicit solution for an arbitrary black hole. And if you make sure that this value here, you make the black hole a large enough mass on a scale that's set by the, so you actually have a sort of a, a twofold large limit. You see is large compared to one, that's to motivate, motivate using holography, three, ADS3 CFT2. And on top of that, in order to have weak, weak coupling in the, uh, in the two-dimensional theory, you want the mass of the black hole when you form it to be large compared to. Now you do all this, you then go to the generalized entropy and I've already mentioned this, you put your ADS boundary gets replaced by the anchor curve. You evaluate 
this uh, bulk term between the point on the Antar curve and possibly a point in here and then, or if there is a, a non-trivial uh, quantum extremal surface, you would do a slightly different computation. And in this case, you would compute the, you do a variational problem to figure out what is, gives you the extremal value here, okay? So in order to do that, of course, you need to have expressions. This is easy. This is just given by the Dilaton field. This one is the one where you have to go to the ADS3 CFT2. Now I'm running out of time, so I'm not gonna show you the details of that, but at the end of the day, you're just calculating a geodesic length in ADS3. And there are standard formulas for that. Looks like this here in the variables of the model. And this eventually just, and then we get to the point that I mentioned before that you have to use a coherent state that is a sort of a key step in the, uh, in, in, in the construction, but once you do that, you end up with just an expression, very explicit expression in terms of the location and Kruskal coordinates of, of this point here for a given point on the curve. You can extremize, you can, you can then evaluate, and you get these two types of contributions. You get from this guy here, you get just something that grows with retarded time like this. This one here gives you something that once this guy forms, it has starts out with an area that's the original area of the black hole, and then it actually decreases with time. This is precisely the curve that I showed you before. And the crossover occurs here at the page time, which I said, as I said, is one third. Yeah. All right, now the location of the island has some interesting uh, information. I guess I am really running out of time, so I don't know if I should even go into it, maybe two more, two more minutes. and. Um, but actually, this is a crucial part because if you now start, you want to know where is the island that corresponds to a particular point here at, at some late time, this is say after the page time. Um, what you find, it's just a simple geometry to figure out, but a nice way to, to discuss it is that if you imagine an observer who's traveling along here, or just sits on this dividing line and, and emits a, a light signal. That light signal, in order for it to hit the island, has to be emitted one scrambling time before. And then, of, yeah, okay, depending on if, if, the, if you move the curve away, of course, you'll get some extra time just to the travel time here back and forth. But that's the basic thing is that it's the scrambling time comes in here. Okay. And the other thing that you very quickly see is that it's extremely, it sits very, very close to the horizon. So it's just inside the horizon. Okay. So these are, um, and then one, when you actually start interpreting what this answer means, that you've cut off your, uh, and this is of course where the island concept comes about, the part of your surface that would have been inside this quantum extremal uh, surface here, of your Cauchy surface, sorry, that you're calculating on in the bulk, that's called the island. And some people actually say the island is the entire entanglement wedge of that, okay? And the key thing that because this uh, island here, the edge of the island here, point what I called I is so close to the event horizon, almost none, you know, at late times, this part here where you're come, you know, the bulk fields that you're actually using to evaluate your entropy, they are practically not entering the black hole. They only go very, very close, little in here. And they go back, you know, the time here is actually given by a scrambling time earlier. So you might say, how does that work then for the interior? Uh, it's clear that these fields are not gonna give you, uh, you know, you're not gonna, basically the area of the black hole has become so small, it doesn't have enough degrees of freedom if you use the bekenstein hawking counting to actually give you, to describe, to, to reconstruct the bulk fields in the full interior. You can only do it in this tiny little wedge here on the outside. But this is actually not, I think this is actually a feature rather than a bug. Uh, this is a, because you don't need any more than this tiny wedge. And that is because if you think about the, what, what do you need an interior geometry for? Well, you might want to use it to, to ask 
can I have an infalling observer? What will an infalling observer see? Is he going to run into uh, issues at the, at the horizon or, or, or no? Can I actually construct the, can I encode observations made by an observer in free fall in this region from the information that I have on the, in this entanglement wedge? And the answer to that is actually yes. And this one can see if one, uh, you need to regulate the problem, you need to think about, a, let's say an infalling effective field theory for the bulk would be say an infalling lattice with a Planck scale cutoff like Corley and Jacobson introduced. And then uh, with David Lowe in a series of papers, what we've found is that you can in fact encode those observations up to a point that's very close to the singularity, just with the information and precisely in a, in a, in a, a wedge like this, where the scrambling time comes in in a very similar way. Basically, you, you're, you're, any, any modes that have, are below the Planck scale cutoff before, more than a scrambling time before your observer falls in will already have hit the singularity. So you, don't, you actually don't need to worry about those, but you don't need the reconstruction of the rest of the year is, 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 is the interpretation of that. Anyway, I'm out of time, so um, I don't think I will say anymore. You can do all of this also for eternal, wise, and it, it gives you a story that's very similar to the ideas case. And um, let me just leave it like that, and I will not tell you anything about complexity, even though that's a very nice story too. So, thank you, and sorry for going all the time. Okay, thank you, Larus, for this very nice talk. So is there any questions? Maybe can I ask a sure. question? Uh, Go ahead, uh, please. You mentioned that uh, you can actually also uh, study the infalling observer. Uh, do you know how uh, the your uh, setup uh, easily evades the firewall paradox? Uh, well, that's of course a whole other talk, but um, <laughs> I, I, I do and I don't. Um, in the sense that the way I would do this and the way, in fact, in these this latest work, the later parts of those works with David Lowe, we modeled the black hole as a set of qubits, number of qubits that just gives you the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy. Um, we then tried sort of as a, as a, we explored models where you actually describe the bulk that would be experienced by the infalling observer through some mean field, dynamical mean field construction and then this issue of, of, you know, how do you actually describe an observer who falls in? Well, you add to the black hole a small si system that is the observer and, it's, and his lab. And you ask, when does physics, you know, when you, black hole complementarity would say that when you're falling through the horizon, you shouldn't feel much. And so, you, in this mean field theory, that's certainly going to be true, but eventually the mean field evolution, which is the bulk theory, is going to diverge from the, if you like, exact holographic evolution. So, and then so what's happening then is that the entanglement between parts of the lab, let's say you have an EPR pair or something in the lab, that entanglement between there is being transferred to the rest of the black hole system and therefore the Hawking radiation eventually. This is of course what the firewall paradox is about. If you're breaking up entanglement um, that your semi-classical theory says shouldn't be broken up. Uh, but we, ask, we can estimate how long time does this take? This has to do with some decoherence in this, this model. And it turns out the time scale is precisely the time scale is the scrambling time. And that is also an upper bound on the lifetime of anybody who falls into the black hole. We're not using uh, the, the time that we're using is this infalling um, Goldstrand, Pan-Levé Goldstrand coordinate. And in that coordinate system, which is the appropriate one for the infalling lattice model, the scrambling time comes in. And so therefore, yes, you will run into a firewall, but it's a dual description. The firewall, which is in this quantum mechanical description, the transfer of entanglement is in fact in the dual bulk picture is actually happening because you're running into the singularity. 
So there's a, that's that's the uh, so, you know. Okay. Yeah. Um, you know, look, this is not something we, that we can prove. That we're, we're sort of groping there, but that is what we're groping towards. And it seems a rather, rather satisfying picture that you're, um, you have enough degrees of freedom to describe an infalling observer for a long enough time for, until that observer is actually going to be in trouble anyway because of getting close to the singularity. And the time scales, I don't think they all had to match in this way, but they seem to be doing that. Consistent with the idea of also these works uh, by the US uh, groups uh, uh, um, that are based on this central dogma for which uh, the physics uh, or the degrees of freedom of the black hole that can be captured from outside uh, sort of uh, are able to capture some of the interior of the black hole, but not all. Yeah, no, that's, that's, of course, the central dogma is just this part of one of these postulates that we had at the beginning, you know, this assumption. Yep, exactly. I think we called it postulate number three back in you know ninety three, but um, yeah. but it's um, yeah no that's exactly what I'm 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 using here is that I'm saying that that with these simple models that we had for infalling observers, those are precisely the number of degrees of freedom that you need and um, and yeah that seems you see that's already true long before the page time. And so you have the luxury for the young black hole that you have lots and more degrees of freedom than you really need. And you're still gonna see these decoherence effects because you're still gonna run into the uh, singularity. But after the page time, the black hole only gives you just barely enough to, uh, to describe this. And then there's probably going to be some interesting uh, uh, deviations from, from um, bulk physics that, that would be interesting to study in detail. But it's, you know, you need this, you know, these qubits need to be in some very, you know, this needs to be chaotic dynamics and need to be fast scrambling. So they're not easy to study, but I think there are many interesting questions there. Okay, I think um, we are getting uh, out of time. So maybe it's better if we just proceed to the next speaker. So let's thank uh, Larus again for the, for the talk.